In my previous video, I asked, was there anyone who played the Game of Thrones better than Tywin Lannister? Well, I'm going to briefly address that question with another question. Have any of you perhaps heard of his daughter? Cersei Lannister has to be, in my opinion, the most vindictive, sadistic, cruel and cold-hearted character to ever appear in the Game of Thrones books. Yes, there are some who come very close, but Cersei Lannister just takes things to a whole different level of extreme and what a life this woman had. Hello everyone, Dean here and in today's video I'll be taking you all through the entire life of the woman that you all know as Cersei Lannister and wow have I been looking forward to creating such a video. So I'm going to start with Cersei's early days at Castle Rock to her becoming queen. We're going to talk about her victories, her losses, her heartache and her vengeance. I choose violence. And we're going to go all the way to her demise during the destruction and collapse of King's Landing under Daenerys Targaryen. You're in for a detailed and special video today guys and I really hope you enjoy it. Welcome to Game of Thrones lore, this is the life of Cersei Lannister. Cersei was born in 266 AC as the firstborn child and only daughter to Sir Tywin Lannister, heir to Castle Rock and his wife Lady Joanna. Now Cersei was born shortly before her twin brother Jaime, who was apparently holding her foot according to the maester. King Aerys Targaryen II sent the twins their weights in gold as a name day gift and commanded Tywin to bring the children to court when they were old enough to travel. It is currently unknown whether this visit to King's Landing actually occurred, as the royal court then came to Castle Rock following the death of Lord Titus Lannister. Cersei and Jaime did eventually visit King's Landing in 272 AC, when their mother brought them from Castle Rock for the anniversary tourney held to celebrate the 10th year of King Aerys Targaryen II's reign. During their early childhood, Cersei and Jaime were inseparable. They actually looked so similar as children, up to the point that not even Tywin was able to tell them apart. Because of their similar looks, Cersei occasionally wore Jaime's clothes and took lessons from the Master at Arms in his stead, without anyone even realising. They played in the bowels of Castle Rock, where the caged lions of Cersei's late grandfather Titus were kept. Cersei and Jaime would dare each other to climb into the cage, and Cersei once dared to go as far as to touch one of the lions until her brother immediately pulled her away. Cersei and Jaime slept together in the same bed when they were very young, and experimented together in a sexual manner from a very young age. During one of these encounters, they were caught by a servant who informed their mother. A guard was placed near Cersei's bedchamber whilst Jaime's bedchamber was moved to the other side of the castle. The twins were told to never do anything like that again, as Joanna would otherwise be forced to inform their father. Joanna Lannister died not long after in 273 AC when giving birth to Cersei's younger brother Tyrion. For killing her mother, Cersei despised the newborn, and shortly after Joanna's death, the Princess of Dorne visited Castle Rock with her two youngest children, Elia and Oberyn Martell. Though Tyrion was kept out of sight during the visit of the Martells, Cersei promised Princess Elia to show Tyrion to her. Threatening her brother's wet nurse before sending her away, Cersei undid Tyrion's clothes and began hurting her little brother until Jaime had to stop her. The Princess of Dorne proposed a betrothal between Cersei and Oberyn during the visit, but she was refused, as Tywin informed her that Cersei was meant as a bride for Prince Rhaegar Targaryen. Lord Tywin first informed Cersei of his wish to betroth her to the Crown Prince when she was no older than six or seven though he told her to never speak of it until the betrothal was officially announced. At the age of 10 in 276 AC, Cersei became infatuated with Rhaegar after meeting him for the first time during the tournament in honour of Viserys birth at Lannisport. Before the tourney began, Cersei's aunt Lady Jenna informed Cersei that her betrothal to Rhaegar would be announced during the final feast of the tourney. After being separated from Jaime following their mother's discovery of their sexual experimenting, Cersei had numerous bedmaids and companions, daughters of Tywin's bannermen and household knights who were of an age with her. While Cersei occasionally appreciated their company, she had not liked any of them, believing them weak and convinced they were trying to come between her and Jaime. 
Following Jenna's announcement that Cersei's betrothal to Rhaegar would soon be announced, she brought Melara Heatherspoon and Jane Farman to a woods witch, Maggie the Frog. After Jane fled out of fear, Cersei inquired as to when she and Rhaegar would wed and how many children they would both have. Maggie correctly predicted Cersei's marriage to the king and the amount of children that they would have, but never stated the king would be Rhaegar. She went on to prophesize that Cersei would outlive her children who would die as kings and queens, and went on to inform her that everything that she had would be taken away by a younger and more beautiful queen. Maggie finally stated that the Veil on Gar would come to end her life. Malara suggested that if they never spoke about it, the prophecies would not come true. However, Malara died shortly after her visit to Maggie, and it is implied that Cersei killed the girl to prevent her from speaking of the prophecies. After Malara's death, Cersei inquired with her septa Saranella about the meaning of Velangar, who informed her it was High Valerian for Little Brother. Cersei eventually became convinced that Tyrion was the Velangar Maggie spoke of, resulting in her despising and mistrusting him even more than she had before. The prophecy of the Velangar has continued to haunt Cersei. After the guests left the Westerlands, Cersei learned from her aunt that Tywin had proposed a betrothal to King Aerys Targaryen, but Aerys refused Cersei as a bride for his son and heir. At the age of 12, following the failure of Lord Stephen Baratheon's mission to find Prince Rhaegar a suitable bride in Essos, Cersei was taken to King's Landing by her father, who still served as Hand of the King. In the following years, Lord Tywin Lannister refused every single offer of marriage for Cersei. According to Jaime, Tywin still had his sights set on a Targaryen match, either hoping to betroth Cersei to young Prince Viserys, or hoping for Rhaegar's new bride Elia Martell to die in childbirth. In 281 AC, when Cersei was 15, Jaime visited King's Landing after receiving his knighthood. Cersei informed him that their father had been discussing betrothing Jaime to Liza Tully. Cersei seduced Jaime and persuaded him to join the King's Guard, which would require him to remain unmarried and live near her in King's Landing. Cersei knew that Tywin would be opposed to the idea, but that he could not openly object to it, and offered to make the arrangements herself. However, she had no idea how much the relationship between her father and the king had deteriorated, and although Ares did award Jaime a place within the Kingsguard, Tywin perceived Jaime's appointment to the Kingsguard as a slight by King Ares intended to rob him of his heir. Furiously, he resigned as Hand and moved back to Castle Walk with Cersei, separating the twins once more. After the conclusion of Robert's Rebellion, a marriage was arranged between Cersei and the new king, Robert Baratheon I, in order to seal the new royal house's alliance with House Lannister. Cersei and Robert were to wed in 284 AC. Nonetheless, Cersei was at first enthralled by the happy crowds at the royal wedding. However, her enthusiasm for the match ended when Robert called her Lyanna during their first night together. The marriage rapidly deteriorated, and Cersei resumed her incestuous relationship with her brother. She bore him three children, Joffrey, Marcella, and Tommen, all of whom she successfully passed off as Robert's true-born heirs. Although the king was away during the births of his children, Jaime was present for at least Joffrey's birth, though Cersei refused to let her brother hold the child, fearing people might start to suspect his true parentage. On one occasion, early in her marriage, Cersei became pregnant by Robert. Unwilling to give birth to Robert's child, she sent Jaime out to find a woman to cleanse her. Having grown to resent Robert over the years, Cersei took further care to ensure he did not impregnate her. During the early years of their marriage, Cersei declined Robert's invitations to hunt with him, as Robert's trips allowed her more time with Jaime. Because two of Robert's Estermount uncles from Greenstone had remained at court, for half a year following Cersei's marriage, Robert insisted on repaying the visit, and Cersei and Jaime accompanied him for a two-week stay at Estamont. While there, Cersei suspected that Robert was sleeping with a cousin of his, and had Jaime follow Robert to confirm her suspicions. Cersei and Jaime slept together on Greenstone, and she likes to believe that that was the night their eldest son, Joffrey, was conceived. While Robert claimed his rights frequently during the early years of their marriage, his drinking led to him hurting Cersei during those encounters. When she confronted him once during the first year of their marriage, 
Robert claimed it was because of the drink, and he was not to blame. When he tried to take another horn of ale, Cersei smashed her own horn in his face, chipping his tooth. Robert claimed not to remember anything of those nights, but Cersei believes otherwise and is certain that Robert did recall what he did to her, but felt that pretending to forget was easier than facing the truth. Cersei in turn tried to pretend that Robert was Rhaegar during those years, and over time, Robert came to Cersei's bed less frequently, not even once a year. True to Maggie's prophecy, Cersei had three children, while Robert sired several bastards. After Joffrey assaulted a pregnant cat, Robert suggested bringing a bastard daughter of his to court. Cersei threatened the girl, claiming King's Landing was a dangerous place for a girl growing up. Though Robert hit Cersei for that remark, the girl was not brought to court, and all of Robert's bastards were kept out of sight. According to Lord Peter Baelish, however, there are rumours that Robert fathered twins on a serving woman at Castle Rock in 295 AC and that Cersei had the babies killed and the mother sold to a slaver. Eventually, Stannis Baratheon, familiar with the appearance of his brother Robert's black-haired, blue-eyed bastard offspring, grew suspicious of the royal children's lack of resemblance to their supposed father. He confided in John Arryn, the Hand of the King, and the two investigated the matter together. After the tourney on Prince Joffrey's name day, Cersei and her children travelled with Lord Tywin to Castle Rock. During the fortnight following the tourney, Jon was poisoned and fell ill, eventually dying before he could act. Stannis was convinced that she was responsible for Jon's death and fled to Dragonstone. After the death of the Hand of the King, Cersei accompanies her husband, King Robert Baratheon, to Winterfell, where the King offers the position to Lord Eddard Stark. When Robert and most of the castle go on a hunting trip, Cersei remains behind with her brother Sir Jaime. The two are seen having sex by Bran Stark in Winterfell's broken tower, and when Cersei insists that they must do something to prevent the boy from telling anyone, Jaime pushes him out of the tower window. She later berates Jaime for his impulsiveness, arguing that attempting to kill the boy was foolish, when they could have simply intimidated him into silence. While the royal procession travels back to King's Landing, Cersei's eldest son, Prince Joffrey, bullies a common boy, Mika, prompting Arya Stark and her direwolf Nymeria to attack and disarm him. Joffrey tells his parents that Arya and her wolf attacked him without provocation, and Cersei takes her son's side, arguing that the girl should lose a hand in accordance with the ancient penalty for striking a prince of royal blood. While Robert again resists Cersei's call for severely punishing Arya, the Queen successfully pressures him into ordering the execution of another direwolf, Lady, as a proxy at Darry. Having appointed Eddard Stark as John Arryn's replacement, Robert orders the Hand's tourney to be held in honour of Eddard. Cersei forbids Robert from fighting in the melee, inciting a public argument between King and Queen. Robert intends to fight anyway but Eddard and Sir Barris and Selmy succeed in dissuading him. Later, Lord Varys claims that Cersei had known publicly forbidding Robert from participating in the melee was the most effective way of convincing him to do so and had been planning to have him accidentally killed in the melee. He also suggests that Sir Hugh of the Vale, who had been killed by Sir Gregor Clegane earlier in the tournament, could have poisoned John Arryn at the Lannisters' instigation only to have them arrange his death in order to ensure his silence afterward. When Cersei's brother Tyrion is abducted by Catelyn Stark, Cersei argues with Robert, insulting his manhood for his failure to immediately avenge the insult to her family. The king strikes her in response, but Cersei tells him that she intends to wear the bruise as a badge of honour. Eddard does not approve, and Robert admits that it was not kingly, but blames Cersei for provoking him. Eddard, who has been investigating John Arryn's death, discovers the truth about the royal children's parentage. While the king is hunting in the Kingswood, Eddard confronts Cersei, who admits the accusation is true. She attempts to seduce him, but he refuses. Not wanting to see the children harmed, Eddard warns her that he intends to tell Robert the truth and urges her to flee with the princess and the princess. He plans to have his daughters Sansa and Arya sail from King's Landing on the Wind Witch. But Sansa, not understanding the danger and desiring to marry Joffrey, informs Cersei of her father's plan. A drunken Robert is fatally injured by a boar during his hunt. 
Having been given strong wine by his squire, Lancel Lannister, on his deathbed, Robert names Eddard regent until his 13-year-old heir, Joffrey, comes of age. Though Eddard secretly changes my son Joffrey into my heir. The morning of Robert's death, Cersei seizes power, denouncing Eddard as a traitor who conspired against King Joffrey. She has Eddard imprisoned and is named Queen Regent, heading Joffrey's small council. Cersei intends to have Eddard convicted of treason but allowed to take the black, thus discrediting him and removing him as a factor in the political arena without antagonising the North. She arranges a public confession for him on the steps of the Great Sept of Baylor, assuring the High Septum that he will be offered forgiveness and that the holy ground will not be profaned with blood. However, Joffrey ignores her advice and instead orders Lord Stark's immediate execution. Janos Slint and Sir Ilan Payne carry out the king's imprudent command before Cersei can intervene, deeply offending the faith and rendering peace between Stark and Lannister impossible. Cersei weeps when she hears that Jaime has been captured by Rob Stark in the Whispering Wood. She keeps the news of Renly Baratheon's coronation from Joffrey for a long time, fearing he might take the field at the head of a force of gold cloaks. She commands her father to come to the defence of the capital against Renly and the Tyrells, but Tywin instead marches for Harrenhal and sends Tyrion to the capital in his stead. And when Tyrion arrives in King's Landing, bearing a letter from their father, Cersei threatens to have him thrown in the dungeon but he placates her by saying he could rescue Jaime. As Hand, Tyrion struggles to wrest control from her, finally resorting to poison to incapacitate her for a few days. In Jaime's absence, Cersei begins sleeping with her cousin, the knighted Lancel, which is discerned by Tyrion. She also reveals to Tyrion that she had given Lancel fortified wine for Robert's hunt, stronger than Robert usually drank. After Tyrion sends away Cersei's personal guard, she employs three swords to replace them, Osni, Osmond and Osfried Kettleblack. But Tyrion finds out and buys their loyalty over Cersei's. Tyrion deceives small council members and determines that Pycelle is Cersei's agent. When he arrests Pycelle, the Grand Maester tells him that Jon Arryn had been recovering from his poisoning and that he had sent Jon's Maester away in order to prevent Jon's full recovery, assuming that Cersei wanted Jon dead. Tyrion gets Cersei to agree with sending Marcella to Dorne to win over House Martell. The day Princess Marcella takes ships for Sunspear, Cersei is among those caught up in the riot of King's Landing, provoked in part by a thoughtless comment she makes to King Joffrey about a dead baby. As Stannis Baratheon moves on King's Landing, Cersei sends Tommen to Rosby for safety, but Tyrion's men intercept the party and take the boy into Tyrion's custody. Fed up with Tyrion's efforts to rule, Cersei arrests Alayaya, a whore with whom she believes Tyrion is sleeping with, and has the girl beaten. She uses Alayaya as a hostage to ensure Tommen's safe return. Tyrion, however, promises her that whatever happens to Alayaya happens to Tommen as well, rapings and beatings included, frightening Cersei. Cersei removes Sir Boris Blunt from the King's Guard for his failure to resist Tyrion's men, and she replaces him with Osmond Kettleblack a man just as hollow. As the Battle of the Blackwater begins, Cersei hosts a banquet for noble women in the Red Keep. She claims it is just an effort to keep their minds off the fighting, but has invited Sir Ilan Payne, the King's Justice, to be on hand to kill them if the city is taken, to prevent them from becoming hostages. When she hears that the River Gate is under attack, she summons Joffrey back to the Red Keep. Seeing the King flee back to the castle damages morale and causes the men to rout, nearly causing her the city. This outrageous Lancel, who feels that they could have held the gates if Cersei had not recalled the king. If not for the timely arrival and attack on Stannis' flank by the army of Lords Tybal Lannister and Mace Tyrell, the battle would have surely been lost for the Lannisters. Because Tyrion lies wounded and unconscious, Cersei is able to lie to Tywin and turn her father's prejudice against Tyrion to her advantage stripping Tyrion's power by the time his convalescence is over. Tyrion believes that his sister is to blame for Sir Mandon Moore's assassination attempt at the Blackwater. Cersei plans the upcoming wedding of her son King Joffrey Baratheon to Marjorie Tyrell. Tywin bends Cersei to his will and makes it clear that his daughter is no longer wanted on the small council. 
Against her wishes, he plans for her to marry again, considering Balon Greyjoy, Aubrey Martell, Horace or Hover Redwin, Theon Greyjoy, Quinta Martell and Willis Tyrell as potential matches. While Lord Mace Tyrell is initially receptive to Cersei marrying Willis, the offer is rejected after Mace speaks with his mother Elena. Cersei intends to keep Sansa Stark as her hostage, but Tywin forces the girl to marry Tyrion. After Joffrey offends Tywin through his ungracious behaviour, Tywin is furious and asks where the boy could have learnt such immoral sentiments. Cersei blames Robert but it is clear to all in the room, including Tywin's brother Kevin, that Cersei is responsible. Joffrey is killed at his own wedding feast and Cersei accuses Tyrion and Sansa, falsely believing them responsible. Jaime Lannister returns to King's Landing with the assistance of Brienne of Tarth and the Lannister twins have sex in a sept where Joffrey's body rests. Cersei rejects Jaime's suggestion of announcing their incest like the Targaryens had done centuries beforehand. Cersei finds numerous witnesses to testify against Tyrion, including his lover Shay, and Cersei names Sir Gregor Clegane champion if there is to be a trial by combat. This leads Prince Oberyn Martell, whose sister Elia was murdered by Sir Gregor over a dozen years ago in the sack of King's Landing, to champion Tyrion. Oberyn is killed and Gregor is severely wounded in the duel. Oberyn's death condemns Tyrion, but he is freed from his cell by Jaime and Varys. Tyrion tells Jaime that Cersei has been sleeping with Lancel Lannister and Osmond Kettleblack. Before escaping the Red Keep, Tyrion kills Shay and his own father Tywin. Cersei's tendencies to paranoia, rash judgement and hysteria increase following the deaths of her son Joffrey and her father Tywin. She resumes her position as regent over her surviving son, the eight-year-old King Tommen, who was obedience to her will. As the eldest child of Tywin, she is also acknowledged as the Lady of Castle Rock by her uncle Sir Kevin. She also has Osney murder the High Septon. Since Tyrion has vanished, Cersei burns the Tower of the Hand with wildfire, the site of Tywin's death, which her twin Jaime considers a folly. Cersei surrounds herself with psychophants rather than honest and competent advisors and she fills Tommen's small council with her own supporters and agents, disregarding the previous arrangements made by Tywin and the well-meant, if blunt, advice from Kevin. She becomes a restless sleeper, troubled by nightmares of Tyrion, who killed Tywin, and also the Iron Throne consuming her. She also recalls the prophecy of the Valangar, whom she considers Tyrion. Cersei suspects her powerful Tyrell allies, now relatives through Tommen's marriage to Marjorie, are trying to seize control of the kingdom. The suspicion grows from a gardener coin found by Kyburn in the dungeon where Tyrion was being held before his escape. A coin similar to the ones Lady Olena Tyrell carries with her when travelling, causing Cersei to wrongfully suspect a Tyrell involvement in Tyrion's escape. Cersei commences a campaign of intrigue to remove Tyrells in King's Landing from positions of influence and authority including Marjorie and her brother Sir Loris, a knight of the Kingsguard. Cersei refuses to honour the debts owed by the Crown, angering powerful institutions such as the Iron Bank of Bravos and the Faith of the Seven. This results in the Faith refusing to bless King Tommen and the Iron Bank calling in all their debts throughout Westeros and refusing all new loans. This causes economic chaos throughout Westeros. With the monies owed, Cersei constructs a new royal fleet of warships and gives command to her rain waters, the bastard of Driftmark, and a sell sale of questionable expertise and loyalty. Two of the Drummonds, Lioness and Sweet Cersei, are named in the Queen Regent's honour. In an attempt to alleviate the Crown's debts, gain the Fate's blessing, and gain more protection from her purported enemies, Cersei allows the new High Septon, the so called High Sparrow, to revive the fate militant, ignorant of its history of causing trouble for monarchs. Cersei sends Sir Balan Swan of the Kingsguard to Dorne to deliver the head of Sir Gregor Clegane. She also takes the disgraced former Maester Kyburn into her service as her Master of Whispers, using him as a torturer and allowing him to conduct immoral experiments on human subjects. She befriends Athena Merriweather, 
who informs her that her maid, Sinel, is spying on her for Marjorie. The Queen is reluctant to aid the Tyrells after Euron Greyjoy is taking of the shields. Cersei instead gives command of the Siege of Dragonstone to Sir Loras, as the Redwind fleet could return to the Reach when the island castle falls. Oran Waters reports that Loras was gravely injured during the assault. Cersei then plots to frame Marjorie for adultery and treason. Having seduced Osney Kettleblack, she has him falsely confess to the High Sparrow that he had intercourse with Marjorie and two of her three cousins, Mega and Eleanor. The High Sparrow acts on the information and has Marjorie arrested when she visits the Great Seth of Baylor. Cersei feigns concern publicly and visits the Great Seth in order to appear, to the population at least, that she wishes Marjorie released. However, the High Septum arrests the Queen Regent for several of her crimes, including the murder of the previous High Septon. The High Sparrow was suspicious of Osney's confession and had him tortured till Osney finally revealed the truth. Cersei's minister seized control of the government while she awaits trial in the Great Seth of Baylor, and they recall her uncle Kevin from Castle Rock to fill her position as regent. Oran leaves with the costly new fleet while Tyena flees for Longtable. Accused of capital crimes, Cersei's only hope lies in a Kingsguard champion to stand for her in a trial by combat. She sends an emotional summons to Jaime, which she burns at River Run without reply. Sir Balin Swan arrives at Sunspear with a letter in which Cersei asks Doran Martell, Prince of Dorn, to give leave to her daughter Marcella to return to King's Landing for a short visit and to invite Doran to take the Dornish seat on the small council that has been left vacant with the death of Prince Oberyn. Doran learns from the informers at the royal court, however, that Balon is to invite Prince Tristan Martell to accompany Marcella but then be killed by outlaws in the Kingswood for which Tyrion is supposed to be blamed, with Balin as a witness. Cersei remains as a prisoner of the Faith of the Seven in a tower in the Great Sept of Baylor, under the care of Septas Unella, Moel and Scalera. To gain access to visitors, Cersei confesses to the High Sparrow that she had relations with her cousin Lancel Lannister, and all three of the Kettleblack brothers, knowing that such sins would not earn her an execution. She continues to deny having ordered Osney Kettleblack to kill the previous High Septon, or that she was involved in King Robert Baratheon I's death. The High Septon agrees to allow her one visitor a day. Cersei learns from her uncle, Sir Kevin, that Jaime disappeared in the Riverlands with a woman, possibly Brienne of Tarth. Kevin also tells his niece about Marcella's injury and of Aerys Oakheart's death at the Greenblood, which leaves a vacancy in the King's Guard. Cersei sends word to Lord Kyburn that the time has come. Before her trial, the Faith requires Cersei to submit to a Walk of Atonement from the Great Sept of Baylor to the Red Keep. Cersei is shaved of her hair from her entire body, then stripped naked. An escort of warrior sons, poor fellows and Septa's protector from the leering and jeering crowds that have flocked to see her, with Septa Scalera ringing a bell and singing the word shame. Shame. Cersei Shame. tries to hang on to her pride during the barefoot walk in spite of the crowds projecting filth at her and the body insults. Faces in the crowd remind her of her father Tywin, her childhood friend Malara Heatherspoon, Eddard Stark, her brother Tyrion and her son Joffrey. She eventually breaks down in tears, however just before finishing and entering the Red Keep, upon her entrance, Jocelyn Swift has her body covered. Cersei is carried into the castle by a giant knight, whom Kyburn introduces as the newest member of the Kingsguard and her champion, Sir Robert Strong. Cersei then dines with Thomas Regent, her uncle, Kevin Lannister, who has been trying to repair the damage that his niece has done. She requests that Lady Tyena Merryweather attend her again once her innocence is proved. Although Kevin has no news of Jaime, Cersei seems certain of his safety believing she would know if he were dead. Later that evening, Varys has Kevin and Pycelle murdered to keep the realm in chaos. Now guys, as the books stop around this period, it's time to switch over to the plot of the TV show, which takes place at the beginning of Season 6. Once again residing in the Red Keep, Cersei is alerted to Jaime's return and runs excitedly to the port to meet Marcella for the first time in a space of around 4 years. 
but her worst fears are realised when she sees a despondent Jamie standing alone on a boat. With the corpse behind him, she immediately realises is Marcellus. Later, Cersei is comforted by Jamie in her quarters and she finally admits to her brother that she believes their children's deaths truly are destined according to Maggie's prophecy. The witch told me years ago. She promised me three children. She promised me they'd die. And gold their shrouds. Everything she said came true. You couldn't have stopped it. Jamie scoffs it off and promises Cersei revenge for all that their enemies have taken from them. When Cersei attempts to leave for Marcella's funeral, with the Kingsguard Knight in tow, a squad of guards blocks her path. Their leader informs her that by order of the king, she is prohibited from leaving the castle in the interest of her own protection. Cersei demands that they move, but the guards do not budge, even when Cersei's Kingsguard places a hand on his own sword. Eventually, Cersei retreats to her chambers. Tommen later visits his mother to apologise for doing nothing when she was arrested and forced her to walk through the streets naked, then asks her to teach him how to rule. Moved, Cersei tearfully embraces her son. Cersei and Jamie later visit Kyburn in his lab, where he has swayed some of Varys' little birds into his service, to Cersei's amusement. When Jamie asks Kyburn to order Gregor Clegane to slaughter the High Sparrow and the Fate Militant, Cersei claims it would not be necessary since she has opted for trial by combat and again named Gregor as her champion. So Gregor can't face them all, and he won't have to. He'll only have to face one. A few days later, Cersei goes to speak to Tommen only to find he is already being counselled by Grand Maester Pycelle. Despite the Grand Maester's claim that he is simply offering his wisdom to the king, Cersei coldly orders him to leave. Once alone, Cersei wishes to speak with Tommen in private, having missed the past several small council meetings. Tommen is anxious to fight the High Sparrow, since Marjorie is still a prisoner, though Cersei reminds him of what the Sparrow forced her to do. Although Tommen knows his mother has always hated Marjorie, Cersei claims the rivalry is unimportant, explaining that kings and queens must command respect, and the High Sparrow is little more than an idealistic anarchist using the faith to achieve his goals. After Tommen reveals his conversation with the High Sparrow and knowledge of something important, Cersei presses him for more information. Cersei and Jaime attend another small council meeting, this time presided over by Sir Kevin and Lady Elena. Though Elena reminds Cersei that she is not welcome, adding her repeated humiliations, Jaime defends his sister, revealing that Tommen has been talking to the High Sparrow about Marjorie and Soloris. Cersei points out that the High Sparrow was expecting them to fight amongst each other, and before the trial, Marjorie will perform her very own Walk of Atonement, which Elena agrees must not happen. Oh no. That cannot happen. That will not happen. I agree. Although Cersei promises to destroy the Sparrows for corrupting Lancel, Kevin warns them that the High Sparrow has many supporters, and more lives could be lost in the ensuing battle. After his failure at the set of Baylor and forced removal from the Kingsguard, Jaime informs Cersei he is being sent to Riverrun to help the Freys deal with Brynden Tully. Despite her brother's protests and anger over Tommen's decision to join the High Sparrow, Cersei advises him to lead the Lannister army as their father intended, confident that the Mountain Sir Gregor Clegane will win her trial by combat. She kisses Jamie goodbye, reminding him that they are the only ones who match. Kyburn enters Cersei's chamber to inform her that the Faith Militant have entered the Red Keep. Your Grace, several members of the Faith Militant have been permitted entry to the Red Keep. Have been permitted. Accompanied by Kyburn on the mountain, Cersei confronts the group. Lancel tells her that the High Sparrow wishes to speak with her at the Sept of Baylor. Your Grace, His Holiness the High Septon wishes to speak with you at the Great Sept of Baelor. When she refuses, Lancel tells her that this is not a request. Cersei retorts that the High Sparrow promised her that she could stay in the Red Keep until her trial, which Lancel replies that no such promise was made. When Sir Gregor Clegane threatens the fate militant, Lancel tells Cersei to order him to stand aside or there will be violence. Cersei says that she chooses violence. Order your man to step 
step aside or there will be violence. I choose violence. One of the Fate Militant attacks the Kingsguard, leaving several visible holes in his armour, but drawing no blood. In response, the Mountain rips the man's head off and tosses it aside, and Lancel and his men back down. Later, Cersei, Kyburn, and Sir Gregor enter the Great Hall to find a large crowd gathered for a royal announcement. The ladies in court look at the Queen Mother in detest. Cersei asks Kevin why she was not informed. There's to be a royal announcement. There is. Why wasn't I informed? There is to be a royal announcement. Kevin then bars her from standing beside her son and tells her that her place was in the gallery with the other ladies of the court. Cersei reluctantly takes her place there while the other women stand aside, not wanting to be near her or Gregor. King Tommen Baratheon starts by saying that the crown and the faith are the two pillars that hold up this world, and should one collapse, so does the other. He also goes on to say that the father judges them all, and if they break his laws, they shall be punished. After much prayer and reflection, Tommen also announces that trial by combat will be forbidden in the Seven Kingdoms. The Crown has decided that from this day forward, trial by combat will be forbidden throughout the Seven Kingdoms. Stating that it is a scheme made by those who want to escape true judgement from the gods, and that Loras and Cersei would stand trial before the Seven Septims as it was in the earlier days of the Faith. As the King leaves, Kyburn tells a shocked Cersei who had been planning on calling a trial by combat with Sir Gregor as her champion, that his little birds have been investigating an old rumour that she had told him about, and that it appears to be much more than just a rumour. Much more. On the day of her trial, Cersei dresses incredibly ornately. She is adorned with fine clothes and all manners of jewellery. However, she does not show up at the great set for her trial, instead viewing the city in the distance from the Red Keep. Unknown to those present at the trial, there is a large cache of wildfire underneath the sept, placed there by King Aerys Targaryen II at the height of his insanity. Cersei has Kyburn's little birds light candles, which will eventually shrink to a size in which the cache can be ignited. Shortly before, Cersei has Kyburn and his little birds murder Pycelle, so as to consolidate all power to her. The explosion kills Marjorie, Mace and Loras Sorrell, Kevin Lannister and all of the Sparrows including Lancel and the High Sparrow, and a number of King's Landing citizens. Cersei watches amused and then goes on to confess her sins including her incestuous relationship with her brother, the murder of her husband and the explosion of the Great Set to a captured Septa Unala. Later, she gives her as a prisoner to the mountain so that she can be tortured, calling out shame continuously upon her departure. Shame. Shame. She also states that Nella is not going to die for some time. Following the destruction of the Sept of Baylor, Tommen commits suicide by jumping out a window. Cersei orders that his body be burned and the ashes buried at the ruins of the Sept, along with the ashes of her father, elder son and daughter. Through right of conquest, she has Kyburn crown her Queen of the Seven Kingdoms. During the coronation, she sees Jaime from afar, who gives her a very grim look. Following her coronation, Cersei shows Jaime a giant map of Westeros and discusses the multiple foes they now face. While Cersei has dreams of ushering in a long dynasty, Jaime reminds her that they are losing the war, and with all their children dead, there is no Lannister line to inherit the Iron Throne. When Jaime asks Cersei about Tommen, she responds angrily that he betrayed them by committing suicide. Our baby boy killed himself. He betrayed me. He betrayed us both. Should we spend our days mourning the dead, mother, father and all our children? Cersei. I loved them, I did. But their ashes now, we're still flesh and blood. Cersei adds that they are the only living Lannisters who count, and Jaime tells her that they need allies and reports that House Frey has been exterminated. Cersei angrily reminds him that she has been listening to their father's counsel for the past 40 years and has learned some things. 
think I listened to father for 40 years and learned nothing. They later meet with Euron Greyjoy to discuss a possible alliance. Though Cersei declines his offer of marriage, Euron graciously departs, promising to return with a gift that will win her heart. Later, Cersei gives a speech urging several nobles from the Reach, including Lord Randall Tarly, to reaffirm their allegiance to the Iron Throne and not follow House Tyrell in supporting Daenerys Targaryen. Cersei warns that the Targaryen Dothraki and the Unsullied Hordes would pillage their lands and homes and rape their women. When Lord Tarly points out that Daenerys has three dragons, Kyburn replies that he is at work on a solution. Later, Kyburn leads Cersei to the dragon skulls beneath the Red Keep. He tells Cersei that his spies have reported that one of Daenerys' dragons was wounded by a spear at Marine, showing that the dragons are not invincible. Kyburn then displays a ballista and reassures Cersei that he can hurt dragons. Cersei tests the ballista on a nearby skull of Valerian the Black Dread, the dragon, the largest dragon, of Aegon the Conqueror, and is pleased when the bolt pierces straight through the massive hard skull. Euron Greyjoy returns to the capital with Ilaria and Tien Sand, the women who poison her daughter Marcella. In recognition of Euron's gesture of good faith, Cersei agrees to Euron's marriage proposal, though only after the war is won, and names him commander of the Iron Throne's naval forces. She is cheered by the attendants in the throne room following her success, propagandizing her defense as being compromised of the sons and daughters of Westeros. Cersei has Alaria and Tien both chained and gagged in one of the black cells. She tells Alaria that even though they are enemies, she understands her captive's fury. She calls to mind how skillful a fighter Oberyn was up until the point when he got killed, taunting Alaria by insinuating Oberyn brought his own death upon himself by taunting Gregor instead of just leaving him to die. Now he's buried somewhere, and he is Sir Gregor stronger than ever. That must be difficult. She then reveals her own grief at losing her only daughter and walks over to Tien, complimenting her beauty before ungagging her and kissing her full on the lips with the very same poison that Alaria used on Marcella. Kyburn puts the gag back on Tien and gives Cersei the antidote. Cersei tells Alaria that she intends to keep her alive to watch Tien die and rot in the cell, even if they have to force feed her. She then expresses her delight by intimately engaging with Jaime, after which she announces that, as queen, she doesn't care if the servants know of their incest. Then, Bernadette arrives, differing from the subject of Jaime, telling Cersei that Tycho Nestoris of the Iron Bank of Bravos has arrived. Following this, she forms an alliance with Tycho, hoping that she will gain a loan after Jaime has successfully taken High Garden. Tycho agrees to this possibility, as Daenerys has cost them many shares in wealth due to her ending of slavery in Slaver's Bay. After the sack of Highgarden, Cersei meets with Tycho, who is pleased that Cersei will use the captured gold to pay off the Iron Throne's massive debts to the bank, and he engages in open flattery by saying that she is as cunning at military strategy as her father Tywin was, if not even more so. Now that the Lannisters' old debts will mostly be paid off, and the Iron Bank's faith in them somewhat reassured by their recent military victories, Cersei wants to take out new loans to strengthen her position in the war, so she can finish securing control over the rest of the continent. They discuss that Cersei wants to use the money to hire foreign sellsword companies to bolster the depleted Lannister military ranks. Specifically, she reveals that she has had Kyburn make overtures to hire the best and largest private mercenary army in all of the free cities, the Golden Company. Taicho assures her that the Iron Bank will be delighted to help her with these future endeavours once it receives the gold she is bringing them. Jaime returns to King's Landing to inform Cersei of their defeat in the Battle of the Gold Road. He flatly insists that the Lannisters have no chance of defeating Daenerys, even if Cersei were able to buy enough mercenaries to replace their huge losses. Kyburn Scorpion did little more than anger Drogon, and neither the Lannister soldiers nor any mercenaries will be able to match 
the huge horde of Dothraki, who Jaime notes killed their men as if it was sports to them, not war. Cersei snidely asks Jaime if they are expected to surrender to a queen whose throne Cersei occupies and whose father Jaime betrayed and murdered, mockingly remarking that Tyrion could intercede for them with Daenerys. Jaime reveals to Cersei that Tyrion is innocent of Joffrey's murder, telling her that Elena Tyrell confessed to it. Cersei is at first dismissive, so Jaime begins to talk her through it, asking her rhetorically if Elena will prefer Marjorie to marry the strong-willed and sadistic Joffrey or the emotionally pliable and good-natured Tommen. Effectively, Elena would have become the true ruler of the Seven Kingdoms behind the scenes, in the same way that their father Tywin Lannister became the true ruler of Westeros through his grandsons. Feeling cheated of yet another vengeance, Cersei can barely contain her fury as she laments listening to Jaime, saying Elena ought to have been flayed alive, died screaming. Jaime then points out that such vengeance is pointless, with House Tyrell now being extinct, as well as their isolation from anybody else of significance. Cersei then summarises to say that she will fight to the bitter end rather than surrender. Fight and die or we submit and die, I know my choice. The soldier should know his. Later at the Red Keep, Kyburn is visiting Cersei when Jaime enters her chambers. Jaime tells Cersei that he met with Tyrion. When Cersei asks if Daenerys wants to negotiate a surrender, Jaime tells her that she is seeking an armistice due to the threat posed by the army of the dead. Cersei knows that Bronn secretly organised a meeting between Tyrion and Jaime and says that perhaps an alliance with Daenerys may be a wiser move, but she still retains her determination to destroy any force that stands against her. She also asks Jaime if he plans to punish Bronn for arranging the clandestine meeting with Tyrion. Are you going to punish him? Tyrion. Bronn. She then goes on to reveal that she is pregnant with another of Jaime's children, one who she believes will someday be the heir to the Iron Throne. Far selves, far selves. For this. After reflecting on their late father's advice that the lion does not concern himself with the opinions of the sheep, Cersei hugs Jaime and whispers in his ear that he is never to betray her again. Never betray me again. As the parlay in King's Landing comes into fruition, Kyburn tells Cersei from her chambers that Daenerys' forces are en route to the Dragon Pit. Cersei then warns Gregor that if anything should go wrong, he should kill Daenerys first, followed by Jon and then Tyrion, following then in any order she sees fit, before departing herself. At the Dragon Pit, the various factions meet, Cersei, Jaime, Kyburn and Euron representing the Iron Throne, and Jon, Davos and Brienne representing the North and Daenerys' court. When Cersei demands to know where her rival is, the Dragon Queen makes a suitably dramatic entrance on Drogon's back, with Rhaegal flying overhead. Euron tries to posture, threatening to kill Yara unless Theon yields to him and deriding Tyrion's dwarfism. When Tyrion and Theon retort to his taunts with their own, Euron remarks that Tyrion would have been killed at birth in the Iron Islands. We don't even let your kind live in the Iron Islands, you know. We kill you at birth. A furious Jaime orders Euron to sit down, and when he disregards the warning, Cersei reiterates it, and a subdued Euron then returns to his seat. Getting the meeting on track, Tyrion, Daenerys and Jon try to warn Cersei of the greater threat coming for them all but she dismisses it as a ploy to trick her into lowering her defences. To prove their claims, Sandor Clegane returns with the crate containing the white, which is silent. Sandor gets the crate open, but there is still no movement. He finally gives the crate a massive kick, which prompts the enraged white to launch itself out and charge toward the nearest target, Cersei appropriately enough. <laughs> Visibly horrified, the Lannister Queen and her allies recoil in horror as Sandor pulls the white back on a chain. 
its claws inches from Cersei's face, and he manages to slice the creature in half when it turns to attack him. The assembled look on in shock as the white's upper half still moves around. Jon steps forward and picks up the white's discarded hand, and using a torch provided by Sir Davos, demonstrates how fire can be used to stop them. He then uses a dragonglass dagger to the heart to end the white's upper half, bluntly stating that if they don't win the coming war, such a fate awaits every single person in Westeros. There is only one war that matters. The Great War. A horror-struck Jamie asks how many whites are coming. How many? 100,000 at least. And when Daenerys tells him that the army of the dead amasses numbers of at least 100,000, Euron then asks if the whites can swim. And when Jon responds that they can't, Euron then announces to Cersei that he intends to withdraw the Iron Fleet back to the Iron Islands. He declares that he has been all over the world and has never been terrified until now. I'm taking the Iron Fleet back to the Iron Islands. What are you talking about? I've been around the world. I've seen everything, things you couldn't imagine, and this... This is the only thing I've ever seen that terrifies me. On his way out, he tells Daenerys to retreat back to her island while he returns to his own, and to come find him when they are the only two left alive. Seemingly convinced, Cersei immediately offers terms. Satisfied that Daenerys is concerned with the army of the dead, Cersei will not withdraw her troops, but will guarantee that they will not hinder the Targaryen or Northern forces in any way during the battle against the White Walkers. She refuses to deal with Daenerys at all, however, calls on Jon Snow as the King in the North and Ned Stark's son to keep the truce and to stay out of any future conflict between Cersei and Daenerys. Jon, however, says that he cannot serve two queens. I cannot serve two queens. And I've already pledged myself to Queen Daenerys of House Targaryen. And reveals to all assembled that he has already declared for Daenerys, infuriating all three Lannisters present. Declaring that there will be no truce if it is just she and Daenerys, Cersei storms out, content to let the Starks and Targaryens battle the undead alone, and then deal with whomever emerges victorious from that conflict. Tyrion later enters Cersei's office, and the two trade savage words, although she finally acknowledges that Tyrion did not kill her son Joffrey, Cersei blames his murder of Tywin for the series of events that led to her younger children's deaths and the destruction of House Lannister's future. I mean to you, do you have any idea what you did when you fired that crossbow? You left us open. You laid us bare for the vultures and the vultures came and tore us apart. You may not have killed Joffrey, but you killed Marcella, you killed Tommen. Tyrion maintains that he loved Marcella and Tommen almost as much as Cersei, and that he regrets dearly what happened to them. He attempts to call Cersei's bluff, claiming that if Cersei genuinely blamed him for their deaths, then Gregor should just kill him right then and there. A tense moment passes in which Cersei does not give the order, and relieved, Tyrion heads straight for the wine. They continue their discussion until Tyrion realises that Cersei is pregnant. All three Lannisters then return to the Dragon Pit, and Cersei has agreed to work with Daenerys but not by keeping her troops back. The Lannister army will march north to fight alongside the Starks and Targaryens. After the enemy delegation has left, an eager and relieved Jaime meets with his commanders to discuss the logistics of moving the army north. Cersei enters the map room and asks him what he is doing. Dismissing the commanders, she tells Jamie he really is the stupidest Lannister. Shocked, Jamie listens as Cersei explains that Euron has not abandoned her, but has gone to Essos to ferry the Golden Company back to Westeros. She intentionally leaked her pregnancy to Tyrion so he would believe her, and now she intends to allow their enemies to exhaust themselves against the army of the dead, then have the Golden Company mop up the remnants of whoever is left in the north conveniently forgetting that if the dead win, their numbers will increase even more. Guys, you saw a dead man trying to kill us. And I saw it burn. If dragons can't stop them, 
If Dothraki and Unsullied and Northmen can't stop them, how will our armies make a difference? This isn't about noble houses. This is about the living and the dead. Then I intend to stay amongst the living. Jamie is completely furious that his sister and Euron plotted this behind his back, but Cersei angrily accuses him of plotting with Tyrion in favour of her enemies. Reading from the accusation, Jamie incredulously reminds her that whoever wins the conflict in the north will turn their attention south afterwards. Either the White Walkers will march south to kill them, or the Starks and Targaryens will come seeking revenge over the fact that Cersei betrayed and left them, and essentially all of Westeros to die. But Cersei is indifferent. Finally seeing his sister for the manipulative, untrustworthy, power-mad narcissist that she truly is, Jaime disgustedly declares that he is at least willing to fight to honour the pledge he made. When he tries to leave, he finds his way blocked by Sir Gregor. Cersei furiously insists that she will kill him as a traitor if he tries to leave. But Jaime calls her bluff and storms out. I don't believe you. And Cersei does not give the order, unable to kill the only man she has ever loved. As she watches Jaime leave, both betrayed and saddened, snow begins to fall on her city, showing that winter has finally reached the south. Cersei is standing on the ramparts of King's Landing, looking at Euron's Iron Fleet, when Kyborn brings her the news that the wall has been breached. She coolly replies, good, and goes to meet Euron in the darkened throne room. Euron continues to press his suite of marriage and after much persistence, Cersei allows him to follow her into her chamber. The two engage in sexual intercourse and, despite her apparent satisfaction, Cersei calls Euron the most arrogant man she's ever met. When Euron claims he will make her pregnant and then leaves the room, Cersei's face becomes drawn and pensive. After Euron informs Cersei about his success in ambushing the Targaryen forces near Dragonstone, she lies to him that she is pregnant with his child. To deter Daenerys from launching an all-out attack, she allows in civilians to enter the Red Keep. And after the Unsullied besiege King's Landing, she ignores Tyrion's pleas for surrender to Daenerys and has Missandei beheaded in front of the Dragon Queen. Cersei's plan however backfires as Daenerys has Drogon slaughter her forces and the civilians in King's Landing. She is initially hesitant to leave the Red Keep but eventually gives in to Kyburn's suggestion to leave for Maegor's holdfast. Her Queen's Guard, however, is crushed by the debris or killed at the hands of Sandor Clegane, with Kyborn being killed by Gregor, and she is forced to flee alone. The wounded Jaime finally finds her and convinces her to flee the city. The twins, however, are trapped in the cellars and are crushed by the falling debris. And that concludes the life of Cersei Lannister. Thank you very much for watching. Thank you so much for watching. I truly, truly appreciate your support. Everyone, notifications of uploads are more important than ever. So please, if you haven't already, turn those notifications on to make sure you're notified the moment my video goes live. Making videos is what I love to do. It's my dream and my passion. However, it does cost time and money to produce this content. So if you have a dollar to spare to support me on Patreon, in exchange for some exclusive unseen content, then you can click the Patreon link below or at the end of this video. Please only support me if you can afford it. And make sure to follow me on Instagram at InstaDNJ and on Twitter at Potter Folklore. Check out my other videos appearing on screen and please make sure, most importantly, to hit that subscribe button. Thanks again everyone and please have a great day.